professor at the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'd like to speak to you today about uh, story and storytelling. It's a, it's a way of thinking about information. It's a way of um, organizing information, if you will. And I think it's one of perhaps the most powerful ways to organize information. But let's step back a bit and, and think, what exactly is a story? A story, if thought of sort of in general terms, is something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and just as this speech will have a beginning, middle, and end, and so I hope it in some senses is a story, um, I'd like to, to talk about how story can organize the various kinds of information that we have. But story is also a little more deep than that. It's about character. Um, it's about a sequence of events, usually. It's about a progression of things happening. Um, and it's a way to tie all of those sort of disparate pieces together into a unified whole. And it's that kind of approach where you think of information or data, perhaps, as dots on a screen. And the story is the way you connect those dots. And so you think of with, I mean, I, I usually think in terms of children's stuff because I, I teach children's work. Um, but with storytelling, you think of these dots on the screen, and then if you connect them in one way, you'll end up with a particular kind of picture. And of course, if you connect them in a different way, then you end up with a different picture. Um, and so it's how we connect the dots of information that leads to how we create, or the kinds of stories we create, and the kind of spin we put on those stories. But it's even deeper than that for me. Uh, storytelling is not so much about plot. It's not so much about character. Storytelling is really a way to convey emotions and build community. And that's fundamentally, in my mind, what storytelling and story listening is all about. As I tell a story, it's not usually a, a canned performance. It's something that I create on the spot as we go along. I have a basic outline of the story in mind. But as I tell the story, it unfolds as I get feedback from the audience. And so it's, it's not a rote or a, or a memorized uh, presentation. And it's really that emotional power of the story that we're trying to convey as storytellers, and actually I think often as teachers as well, and as information specialists. We want to get to the deep meaning, the deep power that undergirds and underlies the information that we're trying to share. That's what makes it persuasive. Um, and so it's, it's a way of taking all of these disparate things and weaving them together. If you will, uh, another metaphor, because uh, I think metaphors figure fairly strongly in the story. Um, story then may be the way in which we weave together the disparate pieces and so if the information is the thread then the fabric that we end up with or the actual garment or the cultural overtones to that garment all of those things are the actual story okay so with that in mind the idea that story can cloak if you will cloak information and thereby make it more accessible, let me tell you a story. There's a great story. Um, it's a Jewish story. And it's a story about two beautiful, beautiful women. And these two women, once, long, long ago, as all these stories happen, long ago, these two women lived in a small house at the edge of a village. And the two women were exceedingly beautiful. And one day, they were having a slight discussion, and the discussion became an argument, and they began to talk about who was the most beautiful, and who would be the most accepted by the villagers. And it began to get really heated, and so finally they decided that they would have a contest. And the contest was that they would both, one at a time, walk through the village, and they would see who had the most friends. And so they agreed. Truth went first. Truth walked out, and as she walked down the central village street, the people who were out on their lawns began to ease back into their houses. 
Some of them who were up in their windows closed the shutters. And by the time Truth had got to the end of the village, there were very few people left outside. So she got to the end and she turned around and she was thinking to herself, I'm going to lose this contest. What can I do to make myself even more attractive? And she thought, there's really only one thing left to do. And so she disrobed. She took off her great robe, and she stood there completely naked. And then she walked back through the village, thinking that people would flock from their houses to see her. But indeed, it was the opposite. All of the remaining people went back into their houses. They closed their shutters, and they disappeared. And she eventually ended up walking back all the way by herself. Well, she got back there, Truth did, and she met her companion, and her companion was Story. And Story said to her, well, how did it go? And Truth said, I can't believe it. There was no one there. And Story said, one moment, let me try. And so Story left, and she walked along. And as she walked through the village, all of the people began to come out of their houses. The windows opened. They came down and they began to talk and mill and talk amongst themselves. It was a wonderful gathering. She walked all the way to the end, people streaming behind her. She turned around, walked back. The entire village gathered in the center as she walked through. Well, she got back and Truth was quite humble. And she said, I'm sorry, I, I have lost the contest. And I realize now that story is more powerful. And Story walked up to her and she said, it's not that Story is more powerful. It's just that nobody likes the truth. And especially they don't like the naked truth. If what you need is to get across your point, what you need is the mantle of Story. And so Story took her beautiful multicolored cloak, draped it around the shoulders of truth, and that time, when Truth went back into the village, the people came out because now they could hear what she had to say. That's a story from uh, Israeli tradition, from, from the Jewish tradition. Um, so what, what does story allow us to do? Um, as that story shows, it allows us to say what we need to say without appearing didactic, without appearing um, overly persuasive. And it, it sort of cloaks what we want to have heard in a beautifully accessible way. Um, and so we understand the deeper meaning of story and the deeper meanings of the information because of this shell that we put around it, uh, this, this narrative shell. It also, if it's told well, it allows you to enter a different space. And I think that's one of the most profound things with, with storytelling. And hopefully it, it can be ported over into other things like teaching um, and, and information and interactions. But what it does is it, it seems to, at least this is the way people describe it, it seems to transport us. It takes us on a journey. It takes us to another place, a different place. Um, it's a place that J.R.R. Tolkien calls a secondary world that authors try to create when they write, particularly fantasy, but any, any novel or any fiction, they try and create this world that lives while the author is creating it. And once it's done, it evaporates and goes somewhere. We don't quite know where. Um, but while it's there, it's amazingly powerful. Uh, it's very engaging, very immersive, and there's a there's a struggle to get in oftentimes, but once you let go, you tumble into the story, you fall into, you're pulled into the story. There's an impetus there um, that pulls you along. And it, it's more, though, than this sort of willing suspension of disbelief that we have heard probably ad nauseum now. Um, I think it's more than that. It's not that we say, I will agree to this and allow it to happen to me. There's actually an effort and there are a number of research studies that show this, that, that we have to work on our own part to get involved in a story. And when we do, when we're willing to make that kind of effort, then at some point, 
the story takes over and it pulls us along. So there's almost a push to begin with and a pull thereafter um, that makes story listening engaging and, and deeply immersive. Um, and when we get there, when we get into that space, we really experience it as though it were real. Uh, and, and listeners all throughout the nation have talked about the sense that when they are immersed in a story, it is as if it is going on around them. They're that deeply involved with the characters, that deeply involved in the setting. And actually, they are so deeply involved that um, their sense of time changes. It becomes very subjective. Um, some folks say that a five-minute story felt as though it took a year to tell or hours to tell. Um, others, other folks flip it around so that a longer story feels shorter. But there's a really there's a distortion in our understanding of time um, that is is very intriguing. In short, what happens is that we enter, I believe, an altered state of consciousness. Um, it's fairly light. It's not a deep one. Uh, but it is discreetly different, qualitatively different, from our normal waking state. And I'd like to show a model here that will give you a sense, perhaps, of how this happens. Uh, this is a model I've developed through a number of interviews and, um, and readings, obviously, uh, on storytelling and story listening. It's a model I call the story listening experience, and it starts numerically here and follows around from one to seven, divided into four, uh, five main quadrants, four main quadrants. The, the way it works is this. When a person says, wait a minute, let me tell you a story, All right, there's an automatic distinction then between the people, however many there are, in the conversation. Because in your normal waking state, normal, normal waking consciousness, the realm of conversation, Everybody's a teller, everybody's a listener, because we're having dialogue, okay? But as soon as somebody says, let me tell you a story, the listeners here, designated with L, have to agree to be quiet for long enough for the teller to tell the story. Now, it's not always complete silence, because a lot of cultures use some um, sort of integrated storytelling, if you will, where there's a call and response and a variety of different kinds of actual conversation. But there is this sense from the listeners that the teller is going to do something extended and we need to listen. Yeah. So you have that distinction. The teller then begins to create this entity called story. And that can usually begin with something, I mean, the one we're most familiar with in European tradition is once upon a time. Okay? And it's fascinating because those beginnings are often very paradoxical or sometimes even nonsensical. And there's an idea, at least, that I have that, that those beginnings, those paradoxical beginnings, actually help us, by working left brain and right brain, help us to um, sort of fixate the logical brain, the left hemisphere of the brain, and free up the right hemisphere of the brain, which is the visuospatial one, which actually increases the likelihood that we're going to get immersed in the story because it, it almost programs us to visualize what we hear next. It also programs us to accept what we hear next uh, because the logical piece has been shut down. Right? So the critical thinking has gone to a large extent and what's, a, what's left is this visualization process, this fictional process. Uh, so the story is brought in and then the teller and the listener begin to make an emotional connection. Um, and this becomes stronger and stronger as time goes by. As you see here in phase two, we call the story realm here. Um, the teller begins to connect with the story. The listeners are connected to the teller, but they're not yet deeply involved in the story. They don't know enough yet. They haven't built up enough background to understand it. But eventually that begins to happen. As the teller gets deeper and deeper involved in the story, the listeners begin to get involved as well. And at some point here, if it works, and it doesn't always work, in fact, more often than not, it doesn't work, but when it does, the story becomes so pervasive that the teller and the listeners are immersed in it together. And this is an amazing moment, and it feels wonderful, both for the teller and for the listeners, because there's a real communion going on, a sense of community. Everybody's wrapped up in this co-created reality of the story. 
And this is what we call the altered state of consciousness, the tail world, um, passive mode of con consciousness because it feels as though we do nothing at that point, we're just pulled along, um, or an altered reality. That lasts, in a really great story, it may last moments, it may last minutes. But at some point, the teller begins to pull back out, realizing that the story is beginning to close down. The listeners, hopefully, are still locked into that story, really visualizing, really seeing. The teller pulls out. Eventually, the story becomes something that has passed, and we talk about it because it's externalized. And then the story disappears, and you go back to a conversation. But the really intriguing thing about this, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that you don't have to go around the edges. You can cut through the middle, which is why that section is dotted. It's what I call the flicker effect, and it means that if you're here deeply involved and someone unwraps a candy wrapper, all of a sudden it bounces you back and you're in your normal waking state again. But you don't want to be there. You want to be immersed in your story, and so you're, you can pop back in. You don't have to work your way around the clock every time. So this is it's a model of, of the story listening experience that I think begins to explain um, what happens when we listen to a story. Let me tell you another story. It's a story that will illustrate this and give you a sense of how it might play out in life, um, certainly how it plays out in a story. It's a story from India called What Happens When You Really Listen. And it goes like this. Once, there lived an old man and an old woman. And they lived quite happily together, except that the old woman would shake her head often and wish that her husband just had a little bit of culture. Oh, she was so frustrated with him. He was so pedestrian. And she thought, if I could just enlighten him a little bit, life would be much better. Well, it just so happened that one day, one evening, a storyteller came to the village. And the old woman thought to herself, ah, this is just what I need. That storyteller is going to be telling stories from that wonderful epic, the Ramayana. And if my husband listens to him, perhaps he will get culture. And so she went to her husband and she said, you must go and you must listen to this storyteller. Well, the husband didn't want to do that. He had other things he needed to do, like putting his feet up and relaxing. But his wife kept on and on and on until finally he agreed. So that evening, tired though he was, he went down to the village square. But he wasn't all that interested and so he sat way at the back. And as the storyteller began to tell the story, the sound wafted through the air, and it hit the old man's ears, and the rhythm lulled him to sleep. And as he fell asleep, his jaw fell open, and he was fast, fast asleep. And he slept through the entire performance. Well, as is, as, as is custom, after the performance, children ran around and would hand out sweets. And one of the children ran by and popped a sweet in the old man's mouth. And he sort of woke up and tasted that sweetness and went on home. Well, his wife was waiting. And she said, oh, husband, husband, how was the Ramayana? And he said, well, wife, it was quite sweet. Ah, she said, my husband's getting culture. He's beginning to understand. You must go back, she said, you must go back again tonight. And so it was, back he went. But again, he was so tired that as he sat there and the story began to wash over, he nodded and fell asleep again. Well, that night, there was a young boy who had come late. And because he was late, he couldn't get up close. And because there were so many people standing and sitting around, he, he really couldn't see over their heads to see the storyteller. And he wanted to. And he saw this old man whose hunched shoulders made the perfect stool. And so he clambered up on top of the old man's shoulders. And all night long, the young boy watched and listened to that story. 
And when morning came, he climbed down and went home, and the old man woke up and, oh, his back ached. But he stood up and he walked home, and his wife was waiting for him. Husband, she said, how was it? How was it? Oh, he said, it was heavy last night. Oh, yes, she said. Oh, you're getting culture. Oh, this is what? You must go back again tonight, she said. And so back again he went, whether he wanted to or not. And he got there that night, and he was so utterly exhausted that he fell over on his side and went to sleep, mouth hanging open, snores coming out. And that night, just before the end, a dog was walking by, and it accidentally stepped in the old man's mouth and then ran off. And the old man woke up and, ugh, ugh. And he walked back to his wife. His wife was, oh, husband, husband, how was it? Oh, it was dirty. Dirty? Husband, the Ramayana is not dirty. It is anything but dirty. Now tell me what has been happening. Oh, she kept on him. She kept on him until that poor man finally admitted that every night he'd been falling asleep. And so it was that the fourth night, she went with him. And that night they got there early and she dragged him right up to the very front row and he sat there. And that night, the storyteller was telling him a story about the monkey god, Hanuman. You see, Rama, the great god Rama, and his wife Sita, Sita had been stolen, abducted by the demon king and taken to a far off island. And Rama turned to Hanuman and said, please, take this ring, take this ring to my wife and give it to her, and all will be well. So the monkey god Hanuman took the ring, and he had to make a huge leap across that ocean, and he held the ring tight, and he leapt as hard as he could, but halfway over, the ring slipped from his hand and fell into the ocean and disappeared in a flash. Hanuman landed on the island, but he was without the ring. What was he to do? He stood on the edge, wringing his hands, not knowing what to do, and all of a sudden, that old man in the front row stood up, and he said, Don't worry, Hanuman, I'll get it for you. And he dived into the water, swam down to the bottom, found the ring, picked it up, swam to the surface, gave it to the monkey god, and went back to his seat in the front row. And from that day forward, the old man had as much culture and as much wisdom as anyone in the village. What happens when you get caught here in that story listening trance so completely that you're wrapped up in the story and it appears to you as real? What does the listener Need. What does the listener bring to this experience? There are a number of things. Uh, things that I think are very, very useful in today's uh, culture and today's world. One is that there are some requirements of the listener. One is that the listener must be willing to give focused attention. And I think this is really unusual uh, in today's world. We are, we are told that multitasking is the way of the future. Um, we, we watch young children as they talk on the cell phone, work with their iPods, talk with each other, um, walk through the malls talking on their cell phones while talking to each other. They can do these kinds of things. Not that that's necessarily bad, but the storytelling allows you and actually in some ways perhaps demands of us that we listen with a very deep attention. Um, so if we listen and if we imagine those two things, which is in its way multitasking, but those two things are what we're asked to do as story listeners. Um, and there is some evidence that when you hit this deep trance state, that those two things may actually begin to merge. Uh, there's a sense that when we're either in story listening or in reading, for example, that when children say they read and they get deeply involved in it, they no longer recognize that there are words on the page. The pages appear blank to them in their experience, and yet they are obviously reading and following through the story.
So the sense of listening and, uh, and decoding and visualizing may actually merge. The other thing we are asked, not only focused attention, but we're asked to listen very actively. Um, if we allow our attention to wander, then it's much harder to get immersed in the story. So we need to listen carefully. Another thing that is in fairly short supply in my mind in, uh, in today's culture is trust. And trust is inherent to the story telling and story listening experience. The listener has to trust the storyteller. Um, that's partly because the storyteller is going to take them on this imaginative journey and the listener has to trust the teller to bring them back. If this is indeed a light hypnotic trance that listeners enter when they get deeply immersed, there are some physiological and psychological possibilities that could be damaging, uh, could be detrimental to the listeners. And there has to be that sense of trust that the storyteller will wrap the story up, finish it happily usually, happily ever after, um, and make it a cohesive whole that we can then move beyond and talk about. Okay, so in this particular model, the stage seven there where the story becomes something that we have done together. If you don't close it and finish it, there can be um, potentially some, some negative repercussions from that. Um, the other thing we need all of us, as storytellers and as listeners, is a willingness to change. Because this is a journey, as with most journeys, we n almost never come back the same people we left. And with a really good story, it's the same. We either gain information, we gain knowledge, we gain wisdom, we gain a perspective, uh, we expand our boundaries. There are all sorts of things that can happen to us when we listen to story that, um, that change us and transform us. And as storytellers, we hope it makes people better. Uh, that's one of the reasons we tell the stories, is to, to broaden their horizons and deepen their understandings. Um, but we, we need to, the listeners need to want to change in order for the whole thing to work. Be willing to change and have a sense of desire for the change. Um, if that's the case, then the story is much more able to persuade, to alter, to, to help that transformation take place. Um, there are a number of things that facilitate getting into this deep trance-like state. And this next model mentions some of them. By no means all of them, but some of them. Uh, the way this model works is if you think about listening to a story or reading a book, when you start, you start in your normal waking state. And where you end up is, if it's immersive, an altered state of consciousness, okay? Symbolized here by a DASC, otherwise known as a discrete altered state of consciousness. The baseline state of consciousness is the external layer there. And then you have a transitional period from that to the middle. And the transitional period can last a long time, but usually it's fairly short, okay? And all of these tubes, if you will, allow your awareness or your attention to go from your baseline state, your waking state, into this altered state in the middle. And the idea with a storytelling, in fact any persuasive speech, is that you want to make as many of these tubes open and accessible as possible. Because the more of them that are open, the easier it is for one's attention to end up in the altered state. To give you an idea of some of these, and some are perhaps the more powerful ones, the one here at the top, memories, um, if you can get your story to evoke memories in your listeners, if you can get your persuasive speech given by your company to evoke memories in your clients, then they begin to connect on a deeply personal level to the kinds of information and story and the story that you're telling. They begin, actually, some of them, if they get immersed enough, they begin to replace the characters you're describing with their own personal experiences. And they see themselves in those roles. Uh, sometimes novelty is a useful avenue. You tell a new story, it surprises people, it sucks them in. And yet, down here is familiarity. On the, that's the flip side of the coin, is that oftentimes we just want to hear the story that we love. 
And it's that story that gets us engaged time and time again. So those are two somewhat antithetical uh, impulses, but both of them work um, sometimes simultaneously to get you into a story. Um, there's some physical things, such as comfort, physical comfort. If you are too cold, um, if your audience is in, sitting in uncomfortable chairs, um, it's awfully hard, or it's much harder, I should say, to get into a story and really enjoy it. Um, on the same sense, there's an emotional comfort at the bottom there. Um, and that, that is if your mind is engaged in other things. If you don't have the peace of mind to allow yourself to relax and, and listen, fully focused, then your emotional discombobulation is going to, is going to keep you from getting entranced by the story. Um, the teller's involvement in the telling style and the rapport with the teller, there are three of them over there, all related to how the storyteller projects his or her own persona. Um, if the storytelling style is, or the performer's style, is one with which you feel comfortable, it's much more likely that you'll get involved in the story. Um, if the storyteller develops a rapport before even launching into the story, and this is where an introduction to a story is vital, to give your listeners a chance to hear your voice, get used to your rhythms and your cadences, your intonations, uh, the quality of your voice. If you can develop that rapport before you even launch in, then by the time you hit once upon a time, you've already begun to gather your audience and, and get them engaged. Uh, the teller's ability obviously has, has, an, has an impact. A novice teller is less likely, not, in, not incapable, but less likely of getting you uh, your personal preferences and expectations. If you like love stories and I tell you a love story, then the likelihood is that you'll get immersed more easily. The little flaps at the end here are labeled distractions. And the idea is that if your attention is out here in your waking state, and as distraction occurs, all of these little flaps, or many of them, will close down. And that means that your attention cannot get into the altered state. It's stuck in your waking state. On the reverse side, if your attention is in the altered state, deeply enmeshed, and a distraction happens, then all of these flare open and tend to draw your attention back out into the waking state. So the ideal storytelling performance would begin with an introduction that set the stage for this transition, opened up as many of these as possible, allowed your attention to flow into that altered state, and then closed as many of these as possible to hold you there. And there is seemingly a distractibility threshold below which you will remain immersed in a story and above which you'll pop back out and have to get re-engaged. Okay? Now, as I said, this is by no means all of them. Uh, one that I could add here that I mentioned earlier is paradox. The idea that a paradoxical story beginning helps you ease into the story. Okay, So it's a working model, uh, by no means complete. Uh, but it gives us at least a sense of some of the, of the um, influences on our communicative exchange that help us or hinder us from getting involved in stories. Okay? And uh, for, from, the, uh, from the story that I just told, uh, what, what happens when you really listen from India, um, tiredness okay, would figure in there. If you're that exhausted, he simply couldn't stay conscious uh, for the story. So that would be a, a distraction or a hindrance to getting involved. Okay. So we've got the storytelling, story listening process. We've got that moment however long it is, of entrancement or engagement that we, we find fascinating. But it's all very interesting, but so what, in that sense? I mean, why is this important for library and information professionals? Why is it important for anybody to know or to begin to understand this particular process? Well, for libraries and information agencies, um, we want to organize and categorize the world's information. How do we go about doing that? Well, it depends on the information, it depends on the users and what kinds of information they need to know and in what capacity they need to access it. 
But I want to offer that story may be one of the most powerful ways to organize that kind of information. That if we can turn the data into sequences, into events even, um, into something that progresses from a beginning, middle to an end, um, that holds together cohesively as a story does, there may be a way then to, um, for library and information professionals to increase their communicative ability. Certainly when I think in terms of libraries, um, the reference interview, uh, when, we, when we talk to patrons and ask them what they need and dig deeply that way, um, those kind, the kinds of skills you would learn in storytelling are immensely useful in that interaction. And knowing how to engage somebody may prove uh, useful as well. In education, we want to motivate our students. We want them to be motivated, intrinsically motivated, to learn. Um, and teaching in story may be a more profound way to connect with them. Not that all information is storyable, perhaps. I'm not sure. Uh, something to discuss. But I think there, there is a lot that we could do that would take the frame of narrative and the frame of story and use that as our vehicle to convey the information that we want, and it may prove effective uh, and, and a useful technique in teaching. In business, it's certainly effective. Personal stories are used all the time by business CEOs and leaders to um, promote their product, to promote their company, to develop a brand identity. Um, some of the issues here would certainly play into the persuasive power of a CEO. Um, in, uh, in performing in that kind of way. We want them to listen to our stories as, as CEOs. We want them to trust our company, that whole sense of trust that I mentioned earlier. Um, but I think the main thing we need to remember, uh, certainly in, in companies, is that the stories need to be used honestly. Uh, because there is that trust, as soon as you begin a storytelling uh, experience, what you provide then for the client needs to be honest, it needs to be forthright, and it needs to be sort of in the best interest of all concerned. Okay? Uh, there's an ethics, I think, involved in storytelling that applies no matter where you, you put it in business education or, or others. And then in families, uh, we want our children to grow up with values. We want them to grow up sometimes with our own values, uh, but oftentimes we want to help them develop their own values. We want them to grow into caring, discerning adults. Um, and so what do we do? We take the, what we understand as the truths of our lives and we try and cloak them in the framework of narrative, cloak them in story so that the children will be able to access them more easily, remember them more completely, remember them for a longer period of time. Um, it allows children to empathize with characters, um, it allows them to get involved, to identify, it, it helps them become caring individuals, and I think that's good practice for, for the world today. Um, there are some scholars who would say that we actually think in story, uh, that that is the basic foundational unit of the way we think. And um, perhaps, I don't, I don't have any real feelings one way or the other, although I tend, as a storyteller, to lean toward it, certainly. Um, as I say, even this presentation has a framework of story. It has a beginning, middle, and end. It has that progression. Um, but at the very least, what story does is it allows us to share our lives, connect with each other, uh, begin to develop an emotional vocabulary with which we can share our experiences um, and our perceptions of the world, our values, our ethics, all of those things. It's the way in which we have developed to, or the way that we have developed to, to share all of this, uh, this information. Um, and so, let me end with a story. Um, this is a story that comes from all over the world. It's primarily from the Asian countries, Indonesia, um, but it has variants from, from all over the world. And it's a story that shares my values, or at least some of them, um, and so I'd like to share it with you. It's called The Stone Cutter. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there lived a stone cutter. And every morning, he would go out, and he would take his chisel and his hammer, and he would go to the base of the mountain, and he would chip, 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 chip away at that mountain in order to create blocks of stone. 
that he could then carry home, weighty though they were, carry back and sell at the market. Every day it was the same. It was hot work. It was dirty work. And this one particular day he was out there chip, chip, chipping away and he was sweating and he was grimy. And then all of a sudden, who should walk by but the king? And the king was walking there, and he had servants all around him. He had a great cloak over his shoulders. But he wasn't hot because the servants were fanning him with great fans. And he walked along, and the stonecutter thought, Oh, I wish I were that king. If I could just be that king, I would be so powerful. I would have no cares in the world. I would be the most powerful thing in the world. I wish... I wish I were that king. And no sooner had he wished it than, wow, and he became the king. Oh, oh, he was powerful then. Not only was he powerful, but he was cool because his servants were all around him. And he walked on and on. And as he walked on, he began to get a little warmer and a little hotter. And he, he looked up, and there was the sun, the blazing sun in the sky beating down on him. And the longer he walked, the more he realized that sun was stronger than he. And eventually, he took off that great cloak, and he had to walk without it. That sun is indeed more powerful than I, he thought. I wish. I wish I were this sun. And wow, he became the sun. Then, he was truly powerful. He sent his rays down and scorched the earth. He sent his gentle rays down and raised plants up out of the ground. And as he was doing that, he noticed that there was something coming between him and the ground, something white and fluffy. And he realized that when the cloud came between him and the earth, his rays couldn't get through and that the cloud was strong. I wish I were that cloud, he said, and wow, he became the cloud. Then he was powerful. He changed himself into all sorts of shapes, terrifyingly huge shapes that sent people shuddering and running. Gentle shapes that sent people out looking up at the sky. He could influence things. He could rain on things and help them grow. Until all of a sudden he noticed that he was being pushed along through the sky. And try as he might, he couldn't stop himself. And he was pushed and pushed, and he realized that the wind was more powerful than he. And so again he wished. I wish. I wish. I wish I were the wind. And wah, he became the wind. Then indeed he was truly powerful. He roared down across the plains, and the grasses bowed in front of him. He roared across the forests, and the trees bowed, and the people ran. He roared until he came to something and slammed his head right into the side of it and could go no further. And he looked up, and there in front of him was a huge mountain. The top of it went up through the clouds to the peak. The base of it went down deep roots through I wish I were that mountain. If I were, I'd be the strongest thing in the world. And wow, he became the mountain. Then indeed he was strong. He towered above everything. He could poke his, himself right through the clouds. He could look at the sun and not be dazzled. He could send his roots down into the earth. Nothing could move him until he heard chink, chink, chink. And looking down, he saw an old stone cutter gently carving away blocks one by one. And he thought that stone cutter is more powerful than I. I wish, I wish I were the stone cutter. And wow, he became the most powerful thing of all. He became himself. Thank you.